This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream, home to over 2,500 documentaries and nonfiction titles for curious minds. In the last video, we saw that any complex number can be written in terms of its magnitude, or distance from the origin, and phase, or angle from the positive x-axis, through Euler's formula, a e to the i theta. To start this video, let's use that to solve a fairly popular geometry puzzle. Imagine we have a rectangle with a length of 3 and a width of 1, and we draw three internal line segments as shown, coming off the bottom left corner. The angle between the positive x-axis and the first line segment we'll call alpha. Then going to the second line we'll call that angle beta, and up to the third we'll call gamma. The question is, what is the sum of these three angles? This can be solved multiple ways. Knowledge of trig identities can get you the answer, for example. But it's really simple with complex numbers. Because if we consider this a complex plane, the first point would be 1 plus i, the second 2 plus i, and the third 3 plus i. But these can also be written with Euler's formula, where the first would be some magnitude e to the i times gamma, that associated angle. The next would be another magnitude a2, e to the i times beta. And the last would be a3, e to the i alpha. The magnitudes are easy to find, of course, but not important to our problem. Then if we were to multiply these all together, we get a single complex number where the amplitudes have been multiplied and the angles summed together, just basic rules of exponents. And this is what we're after. So to find it, I'll just multiply the numbers in their rectangular form instead, where we get 10i. Since that point lies on the imaginary axis, the phase would be 90 degrees or pi over 2 radians, which is the answer to our question. And with that more fun example, I'm now going to switch gears to something I never fully understood as an engineer in college. It's more advanced, but besides the very end, this should be understandable to most people watching. For those who have taken control systems, what I'm headed towards is the Nyquist stability criterion. Something else we saw in the previous video was how squaring a complex number involves squaring its distance from the origin and then doubling the phase, which just looks cool when applied to a bunch of points. And if we instead apply the function z squared minus 1, we simply do the same thing, then move everything left by 1. Pretty easy. But now I want to input an entire curve to z squared and see what that outputs or maps to. By the way, since this is a closed path, which is all I'll be working with, we call it a contour. Running this through z squared isn't bad though, because we can just take a bunch of points along the contour, run each of those through z squared by squaring then rotating all the points, and then we connect the dots, leaving us with an input and output contour. If I use the same contour but run it through z squared plus 1 for example, well the contour just moves 1 to the right, similar to before. So this is also something not very new. But there is some predictable and useful behavior when it comes to the output contour that we haven't seen yet. If we consider the input path to be a single clockwise rotation around the origin, then the output will actually include two rotations. If my input is here at 2 plus 0i, then that squared is just 4. But notice that as we move the input around, the corresponding output moves twice as fast. Like right now, it's already gone around once, while the input on the left has only done half a rotation. So we end up getting two rotations on the output for every one on the input. There's an easy way to see why this will happen though. All we gotta do is find what makes z squared equal to zero, which would be, well, zero plus zero i located at the origin, which I'll show on the graph with a circle. But due to multiplicity or the exponent, we really say there are two zeros there. And now here's the rule. For every zero inside your input contour, the output will go around the origin once, meaning two internal zeros means two rotations. And this is all assuming the input contour goes around one time, by the way. To really highlight this, I'll change our function to z squared plus 1, because we know the output will simply move to the right by 1. The zeros of this function are plus and minus i, which go here on the imaginary axis. Since they're both within the input contour, we still expect two rotations around the origin, which there is, since the origin is still inside that region. As I increase the constant, the zeros move away from the origin, while the output moves to the right, like you can see here. You'll notice that once there are no zeros inside the left contour, then the output no longer goes around the origin. Okay, hopefully that makes sense, and note we aren't doing anything that advanced, honestly. 
If you know how to square a complex number and add five, then the only thing we've really discussed is that if you plug in a bunch of points along a closed path into that function, out comes another set of points on a closed path that will not contain the origin inside it if the input contour did not contain any of the zeros. Here, let me just show the input and output all on one plot while still using z squared plus five, which has its zeros in those same locations. I'll put an input and output point on the graph now. So like if the input is zero, plugging that into z squared plus five gives us an output of five. As I manually move the input around to any complex number, the output moves accordingly, where it's always the input squared plus five. Now you'll see that if I circle one of the zeros, then the output circles the origin at the same rate. It's just like saying we have an input contour that contains one zero. If I circle both of the zeros, then the output is more chaotic, but it cycles the origin twice as fast, which is exactly what we saw earlier. Then if I loop around some random area that doesn't contain one of the zeros, you'll notice the output never goes around the origin. This means if I gave you some input contour, just a bunch of points, put them through this more complex function, and said, here's the output, you could tell me there is one zero in this region. You know this because the output goes around the origin once. It just barely doesn't have that second rotation and one cycle means one internal zero. Another way to think about this is pick a point on the input contour and put a dot over the corresponding output. Then I'm going to circle the input contour once, just like before, while showing the output move accordingly. And just imagine there's a needle that starts at the origin and follows the output point as it moves. As we trace that output path, the question is, what is the displacement of that needle after one full rotation of the input? And in the end, that needle also made one rotation, which means one internal zero. And this is easy to see because just by looking, we know the zeros are negative one, negative two, and negative three, one of which is in that region. But now let me ask you this. What are the zeros of that same function plus one? This actually makes the problem much more complicated. There's not a simple visualization where we can like shift the zeros over by one. In fact, here are the three zeros I'll just tell you, which isn't remotely obvious by looking. Simply adding that one made things more difficult, but putting those same inputs through this new function and finding the outputs is easy because the outputs will be the same, just shifted by one. Now this graph goes around the origin twice because that smaller loop now also goes around it. If I were to show that needle tracking the output, you'd see two rotations. Therefore, I know this function has two zeros within the contour for the two rotations. If I do plot the zeros, we'll see this is true. I promise we'll see why this is useful in a minute, but just notice that even though adding constants changes an easy question of what are the zeros into a much harder one, I can still easily find how many of those are within some region so long as we have that first output contour plotted. And now I need to address something I've avoided so far that maybe has people commenting already. Everything I've set up till now with the zeros in this region corresponds to circling the origin is true, so long as there's no denominator. Well, one with a variable z in it. So if we have a function with a denominator, then the function still has a zero in this case at z equals negative one, which I'll denote with a circle again on the graph. But now there's also a pole at z equals zero. A pole is just what makes the denominator zero for those who don't know. And I'll denote that with an x on the graph. Just like before, I'll show an input and output pair. And you'll notice if I circle the zero, then the output circles the origin in the same direction, just as before. And if I circle the pole, the output will also go around the origin in a more chaotic way, once per rotation, but in the opposite direction. That's the only difference with a pole here. Contours around it lead to rotations around the origin in the other direction. And if I go around both the pole and the zero, then they kind of cancel where the output does not circle the origin at all. It's kind of hard to tell, but if I let this be my input contour, for example, the corresponding output would be this. And you'll see as I try to manually move along that input, the output moves along that curve, which does not contain the origin. So the more official rule is that the number of zeros minus the number of poles inside the input contour, right now there's one of each, 
equals the number of times the output will go around the origin, which is zero in this case as expected. And the unique application of all this comes up in control systems when the input is a semicircle that runs along the imaginary axis, but also has an infinite radius. This way it encloses the entire right half of the complex plane. The special name we give to this is the Nyquist contour. In controls, we cannot have any of the poles on this right half of the complex plane, so we use this as our contour because we're going to find if any of those poles are inside it. It also do with stability, which I'll explain at the end. It seems weird to plug in numbers at infinity to a function, but when that function looks like this, let's say, the output that I'll show soon will be finite. If you know limits or just end behavior in rational functions, you can pretty much see why. Let me take the radius to zero though, so we can slowly see how the output changes when it goes through this function, which you'll notice has a zero at z equals two and a pole at z equals negative one. When the circle doesn't enclose either the pole or the zero, you'll notice the output does not go around the origin. But once I get that input region around the zero, then the output contains the origin like before. As the radius goes to infinity, then the output really becomes a circle. Once again, the number of rotations around the origin, one in this case, equals the number of zeros minus the poles inside the input contour. Nothing new. Now the real goal here is to find how many zeros are in that right half plane for the same function plus one without really solving for them. This, believe it or not, tells us stability within a control system. It's not bad though, because the output is going to be the same thing shifted over by one. And since that still circles the origin, then the zeros minus poles in the right half plane will be one. The only thing to note is that the poles for these two functions are the same. If I do a common denominator, then you see the bottom is still z plus one. So that means there's still a pole at z equals negative one. Since that's not in the shaded region, then p in this equation is zero. The only thing left to find is the number of zeros, but of course that would be one. Meaning this function is one zero somewhere in the right half of the complex plane. By the way, the number of times this circles the origin is the same as the number of times this up here circles the point negative one comma zero. And since the poles of these functions are the same, we really only need to analyze the easier function up here and its Nyquist plot in order to determine how many zeros of the more complex function are in that shaded region. That's really the takeaway from this. Now in a controls class, when you have a system, like maybe a mass on a spring, we have to find or are often given the transfer function which describes how the system will behave given some input. If that function has its poles on the right half of the complex plane, it's unstable. If you guys have seen my Laplace transform video, you know poles on the right half of the complex plane correspond to a growing exponential term in your signal, which isn't stable because it just goes to infinity. If you want a real world example of that, just imagine hypothetically that the spring constant were negative. That means any displacement, let's say to the right, would cause the spring to apply a force also to the right, making the mass accelerate that way forever. Not physically possible, but it shows you physically what instability looks like. One little nudge causes big problems. Mathematically, if k is negative, just apply the quadratic formula and see what makes this quadratic zero, aka the poles of the function. You'll find one of those zeros is guaranteed to be in the right half of the complex plane, which again means the system is unstable. However, even if you have this weird spring, it's possible to re-stabilize the system by providing feedback. Maybe by using a sensor to look at the position and tell a device to apply an additional input force accordingly to counteract the spring force. That feedback changes the system's transfer function from some f of s to this. That is, if we oversimplify and assume direct feedback like you see here. And to see if that new system is stable, all we care about is whether any poles of the function, or really the zeros of this denominator, are located in the right half of the complex plane. This should look familiar though. We have an f of s that's often given, but we really care about the zeros of one plus f of s, and whether they are, again, in that right half region. This is what we already did though. I was just using a specific function, but the techniques we saw allowed us to analyze the zeros of that second equation by really just using the first. That's the use of Nyquist stability. You can use the easier open loop system and its Nyquist plot to find stability in the more complex closed loop system with feedback without even solving that equation. 
I know these last few minutes probably seem like nonsense to people outside a controls class, but for the people in one, you do have to understand these concepts. And that took longer than I thought, so I'm going to continue with probably my favorite application of complex numbers, which is Fourier and Laplace, in the next video, where we'll see how you can understand both concepts pretty much without complex numbers. But before that, I do want to thank CuriosityStream, the sponsor of today's video. For the people out there who enjoy engineering topics, I recommend their series Dream the Future. This contains several episodes including cities of the future, homes of the future, transportation of the future, and more. These will show you the technologies being worked on right now that are going to have the most profound effect on the future of humanity and will change the way we live our everyday lives. Augmented reality, drone technology, possible methods of transportation, and way more are all included. So if you're interested in technology and what the future has in store, you should definitely check these out. Now, CuriosityStream hosts thousands of documentaries and nonfiction titles within a variety of other topics, including physics in the universe, history, nature, engineering, and more. The service is available on a variety of platforms worldwide, including Roku, Android, Xbox One, Amazon Fire, Apple TV, and more, and it only comes out to $2.99 per month. Plus, if you go to curiositystream.com slash majorprep or click the link below and use the promo code majorprep, you'll get your first month's membership completely free, so no risk in just giving it a try. This gives you unlimited access to top documentaries and nonfiction series that I know many of you will find very interesting. So again, links are below, and with that, I'm going to end that video there. If you guys enjoyed, be sure to like and subscribe. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter and join the Major Prep Facebook group for updates on everything. Hit the bell if you're not being notified, and I'll see you all in the next video.